Hello and welcome to today's presentation on distress tolerance during uncertainty. I'm Dr. Garen Gobranson, a staff psychologist at the University of Texas at Dallas Student Counseling Center. Today we're going to be talking about distress tolerance, specifically during this period of time of uncertainty. Um, and there's some really helpful tips and strategies based on DBT, that is Dialectical Behavioral Therapy by Marsha Linehan, that specifically focus on how to manage feelings of distress, anxiety, um, frustration, anger. So as an overview, we're reviewing um, first defining a crisis, what it is, when to use crisis survival skills or distress tolerance skills. Our first skill, which is the stop strategy, followed by tip skills, and there are four of those. Next, we'll be discussing briefly distress tolerance through distracting, distress tolerance through self-soothing, and finally, distress tolerance through improving the moment. And lastly, we'll talk briefly about how to create a mental health first aid kit of your own to help through these times. Okay, so it's really important to start off by first defining what is a crisis. Um, it's important because we don't want to mistake a non-crisis for a crisis and therefore um, apply skills that should be reserved for a crisis, right? We don't use these skills all the time for all of life problems. So we know we're in a crisis situation when a situation specifically is one, highly stressful, two, short in duration, and three, creates intense pressure or feelings of urgency to resolve the situation. We wanna use our crisis survival skills when there is intense pain that can be physical or emotional pain that cannot be resolved, resolved quickly. Um, the acting on urges or temptations around like um, emotional distress would worsen the situation. Three, if our emotions tend to threaten or over to threaten to overwhelm us or overcome us, that's a time when we certainly want to use our crisis survival skills. And then also when there's demands that need to be met. So if there's some urgent demand that needs to be met, say we need to submit a homework assignment or work on some sort of responsibilities that are there that can't wait, um, we need to be make to engaging quickly with meeting those demands. Next is we want to look at um, when not to use crisis survival skills. So we do not want to use crisis survival skills for everyday problems, solving all of life's problems, or making life worth living. Our first strategy is our stop strategy. And as you see there with the stop sign, we want to use the metaphor again of driving a car. So when you're driving a car down the freeway or highway, you're driving maybe 100 miles an hour. If you have to come to a full and complete stop, that's going to take time and distance to do so safely. Um, conversely, if you're driving on campus or you're driving somewhere with a lower speed limit, say 20 miles an hour, to come to a full and complete stop may only take a matter of seconds. It's the same thing with our emotional state. If we can anticipate really intense distress coming, or if we can catch ourselves early on in that process, it's much easier to stop oneself before we um, engage into behavior or act impulsively or do something that we may find to be um, problematic. So we wanna use that stop strategy to reduce or slow intense emotion that would otherwise have us act impulsively. And we want to be able to be in more control of those emotions. So the acronym for this, of course, is STOP. And the first of the four items is STOP. In the moment, you wanna freeze, stop what you're doing. Intense emotions may compel you to react. We don't wanna react, we wanna act we want to act um, appropriately in that case. Next is taking a step back. This is literally um, maybe taking a step back, taking a deep breath, walking away from the situation. So if you're feeling really intense anger or frustration or anxiety, taking a break from what you're doing that moment, taking yourself out of that environment is going to be really helpful. Next is to observe both internally what's going on for you um, in regards to your thoughts and feelings or externally what is happening in that situation or in the environment that is eliciting that feeling of panic or distress. And then lastly is we want to then proceed mindfully. So after we've stopped, we've taken a step back, we've done some deep breathing, calmed ourselves, we observe what's happening, then we want to proceed mindfully. Hopefully things have de-escalated that we can ask ourselves then the question, what is going to make the situation better? Or what would make it worse? And then act appropriately according to how we respond to that. Next is we're moving through our tip strategies. These are our very specific focused distress tolerance strategies. These are incredibly effective and useful in managing feelings of distress and really intense emotions. 
and they're effective and they're quick. Um, most often when we have folks who, who talk about trying to reduce stress or anxiety, uh, a lot of times people will try to think themselves out of a problem. Um, the problem with that is thoughts are very difficult to control. Sometimes they're intrusive, they're not anything that we can control, or they can even be ruminative as we think about the same things again and again. So thinking is not, trying to think one's way out of a problem is not necessarily the most effective. In fact, what could be the most effective and um, quick way to do that is to change our physiological reactions to things. And we do this by engaging what's called our parasympathetic nervous system. So we're kind of divided between a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. That sympathetic nervous system you may know more commonly as like fight or flight response. That's when we feel like compelled to like, you know, fight back or run away. That's when, you know, our adrenaline gets kind of ramped up and our heart rate increases and we breathe more shallowly and we feel a lot more of that intensity. Conversely, that parasympathetic nervous system response is the opposite of that. It's that rest digest phase. That's what helps us lower our heart rate, um, increase our breathing rate so that we're breathing slowly, more controlled, and it's got a calming, relaxing effect. And we can engage this one of four ways. First is tipping the temperature using cold water. And this is effectively um, lowering that feeling of intensity and slowing things down for us. Next is really intense exercise. I find this to be very helpful specifically with maybe intense feelings of frustration or anger. Um, if you have a lot of that pent up energy or frustration or anger that maybe you feel compelled to lash out or be aggressive, intense exercise can be really effective in dealing with that. Next, we have paced breathing and then progressive muscle relaxation. Paced breathing is calming, relaxing strategies that lower our heart rate and help us breathe more intensely, uh, less intensely, calm things down. And same thing with progressive muscle relaxation, it has the same calming effect. So the first strategy, tipping the temperature, this relies on an evolutionary adaptation that we have as mammals. It's called the dive response. And this is a physiological, involuntary, sympathetic nervous system response. So we don't have any control over this. Even if you wanted to, you put your face in water, you do these things, it's gonna have the calming effect you need. And that's really helpful to know. It's a way to kind of like hack into our physiology and help ourselves in moments of distress. So the way in this response happens, as we're immersed in water or our face is in water, it's, um, this response gets triggered to where we don't aspirate water, our heart rate will slow down. We're obviously not gonna be breathing. So all that oxygenated blood that would normally go to our extremities, and again, for our fight or flight thing, actually goes back to our core, to our heart, to our brain, all the things we need to function in a crisis. So we can engage that response one of three ways, and those are good, a good way, a better way, and a best way. So a good way is splashing water on one's face. Breathing deeply, you can take some deep breaths from your diaphragm, we'll talk about that a little later, and then proceed to take cold water, splash it on your face, as you would if you're removing makeup or washing your face. And you wanna do that for several minutes. Um, better, and the next step would be like a cold ice pack. So taking an ice pack or a cold compress, placing that on your face, your forehead, your neck, anywhere around that area. It's that same kind of thing when you feel like flushed or agitated, you know, that's a way to kind of combat that. And you want to do that breathing deeply throughout. Lastly, the best thing you can do is actually to immerse your face fully in a sink or a bowl or basin of cold water. And you want to take some deep breaths prior to that. You immerse your face fully up to your ears. So your full face is immersed. You pull your face out, breathe deeply, and repeat as necessary. So this is a really effective means to, to engage in, you know, removing feelings of really intense distress or anxiety. Next is intense exercise. Again, we said this is really helpful for feelings of agitation and anger. So again, what is happening during those periods is again, our adrenaline system is, being, is responding and we're feeling revved up, we're feeling agitated. What we can do in that moment, rather than lashing out or becoming physical, or anything else is really to engage in brief, and we're talking a period of maybe 10 to 15 minutes, intense exercise, as is, you know, 
you are able or appropriate. Um, this intense exercise can be really helpful to work off those intense feelings of agitation and distress. Specifically, if you can do cardio exercises, so things like sprinting or running stairs, lifting weights, jumping, or doing burpees, these are really quick ways, again, to work through that initial um, adrenaline system response and burn through that much quicker rather than waiting it out. Next is pace breathing. So this is much more calming than the intense exercise. Um, another word for this is diaphragmatic breathing. So the diaphragm is a muscle that's located below our rib cage, just above our stomach and below our lungs. And when we're doing diaphragmatic breathing, we really wanna focus on breathing from our belly or our stomach area. So breathing in deeply through our nose, holding that breath and breathing out. You can do this a couple of different ways. One is you can breathe this into a rhythm or a count. So breathing into the count of four, holding your breath for a count of two or three, and again, breathing out for the count of four. So you wanna kind of develop a rhythm or pattern when you're doing this. Another really great way to do this is there's a wonderful app by Calm, that's C-A-L-M, Calm, that's free on Android or Apple devices. And in that app is a section called Breathe part of the app called Breathe, and it's a visual way of doing this. But if you're doing this, you can do this either sitting down or, or lying, and you wanna put your hand on your diaphragm. You wanna breathe in deeply through your nose to the count of, again, four. So one, two, three, four. Holding your breath for the count of three, and then blowing out your mouth as if you're blowing out a candle for the count of four. Uh, you want to do this for several minutes, anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, or until the feeling of distress is passed. Next is we have paired muscle relaxation. And a really good way to start this is doing what we call like a body scan. So again, either sitting or lying, close your eyes, and going from the top of your head to the tips of your toes, progressively go through the different muscle groups, areas of your body, and kind of just notice, what are you feeling? Is there any tension, any stress that's built up um, in some of these muscle groups? After you've done that, what you can then do is again, similarly going from the top down is with paired muscle groups, is flexing and then relaxing those same muscle groups. So what this looks like is if I were doing this, I may notice maybe I'm feeling a lot of stress in my back. So flexing my back, I'd want to lean back and put my shoulder blades together, drawing them close, squeezing those muscles in my back till you feel a little tension, maybe even some tightness, holding that for a count of 10, and relaxing your shoulders, letting them drop, and shaking it out, and letting that state of, relax, of tension move to relaxation. And you can do that moving through all the different muscle groups. There's some really wonderful resources online if you want to look up paired muscle relaxation or YouTube videos that will be guided meditation to walk you through that whole step process. Next is distracting skills. So again, we mentioned earlier on, we don't want to use um, distress tone strategies for all of life's problems. And this is why if we use distraction for every life problems, then we have a problem with procrastination or avoidance. So we really want to use this um, sparingly, right? When it's necessary. And we can distract ourselves through several different means. One is we can distract ourselves with different activities or events, um, you know, watching films or movies we enjoy, listening to music, video games, um, spending time with others, reading, painting, any kind of things that, you know, get you engaged and involved. I like to say there are different degrees of activities. There are passive activities, you know, watching movies, can be great, but it tends to be a passive activity. But if you're drawing or painting or doing something that's a little more active, that's almost a little better because it's engaging, it's fun, and it gives you a sense of accomplishment. Next is contributing. Um, finding ways in your community to volunteer, to give back. And, you know, this could be working at a local food bank or helping out. This could be um, reaching out to people in your friend group, um, you know, contacting loved ones, doing things that's gonna bring you out of your problems or concerns at that moment, and also be able to contribute to the larger community. You can distract through use of comparisons. So thinking about times, you know, when things were different or better, or when you want things to be different again. Um, you can distract through use of different emotions. So if you're feeling particularly like 
sad or distressed, maybe you're listening to like upbeat music, or if you're the kind of person who wants to listen to music kind of matches that emotion, that's a way to want to change your emotion. Or, you know, listening to other kind of like music or sounds, watching um, movies that kind of um, could be fun or silly, things you really enjoy kind of help you move your mood away from where you want it to be. Um, pushing away thoughts or activities, it could be literally moving yourself out of a space or a place. So, you know, if you're feeling particularly distressed, maybe it's time to get out of your bedroom or your home and go outside um, or somewhere else where it can be calming. Um, you can distract your different thoughts. So thinking about, um, you know, fantasies internally, things you want to do or have done, pleasant thoughts, things you enjoy, or you can distract through other sensations. Touch is a particularly good one, you know squeezing like a rubber ball or doing some stretching, um, you know, eating or drinking something cold or hot. Next is self-soothing strategies. You want to think about these in terms of five senses. We can self-soothe through vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. Now, for some folks, you may be more of a visual person or more of a touch person or a tactile person. It's good to know what comforts you and what works for you. But with vision, you might want to consider things like pictures, paintings, um, images, drawings, or, you know, being in nature, seeing things that are stimulating and engaging um, or soothing. Hearing similarly, um, you can listen to, again, music, um, sounds of nature, audiobooks, podcasts, things that would be um, soothing or really helpful to listen to or calming. Smell, similarly, is if you have favorite scents, whether that be like lotion or um, shampoo, maybe perfume, or things like that can be really good candles. Taste, this is a really good time to, you know, you've got some extra time is getting into like cooking or baking, finding things that you enjoy that are tasty. Um, you know, making comfort foods, things that remind you of home can be really comforting. And then finally, touch. If you have a pet or a friend who has a pet, you know, petting that cat or dog or whatever your pet might be, um, anything like that could be self-soothing. And then lastly is improving the moment. We can improve the moment through use of imagery. So again, like positive fantasy, thinking about, you know, taking time away, visiting, going somewhere else, um, you know, getting involved in like fantasy world through like, you know, literature or video games or things like that. You can improve the moment through finding meaning through the circumstances of things that are going on, determining what that is for you. If you're particularly a religious or spiritual person, prayer can be a really effective means in improving the moment. Next is we want to look at um, improving the moment through relaxing actions and activities. Um, we can also do throughout all of this is doing one thing at a time. So we're not multitasking. We're not trying to do a bunch of things at once. But really doing things one at a time in the moment, mindfully, fully, and completely. Um, next, we can improve in the moment through taking a vacation. Now, I realize we're not taking vacations right now. Many of us are not traveling or doing that. But a brief vacation, either to fantasy or in our mind, can be helpful. You're taking that trip, planning for a trip, or maybe you're taking a vacation from, you know, your daily life at that time. Taking an hour to go for a drive or taking you know, a day or some time away from your phone or other electronics, um, going for a walk, going somewhere you want to hike around can be really helpful. And then self-encouragement. So reminding yourself you know, of phrases or things that are particularly meaningful to you, considering you know, this is a short time, it'll be like this, this will pass. Those can be really helpful to remember in the moment. And then lastly, we want to talk about mental health first aid. So most people are familiar with the concept of first aid. If we say someone has like a heart issue, people are quick to say like, oh, we administer CPR. Um, but what we don't know, often know a lot about is what do we do if someone's experiencing a mental health crisis? That is, they're experiencing really intense distress or anxiety or panic attack. How do we render mental health first aid to those folks? So you might think of a first aid kit as having items like bandages or gauze or, um, you know, antiseptic. We can make similarly a mental health first aid kit for ourselves. And really all this is, is having a physical kit or a box or something with items that are calming, 
stress reducing. And you want to consider again those areas we talked about. Distraction, self-soothing is a big one. So maybe that box can include items that are particularly personal and important to you, or a coloring book or a puzzle. Um, and your favorite candle or hand lotion that you enjoy the scent. Maybe favorite snacks or items. Um, or you can include like you know, a digital version of this, playlists of favorite music, songs, videos. Anything that's going to be really helpful for you that you can pull out in a, minute, in a moment of distress to kind of self-soothe and calm yourself. Um, and then lastly, please consider contacting us at the Student Counseling Center at UTD if you're a student of ours. Our website's listed there as the utdallas.edu counseling center. That is most up to date with all of our resources and available counseling. That's a great resource to check. And it has also links to this and other of our YouTube videos we have. And then as always, we have our UTD talk number. This is our crisis hotline number. They are open 24 seven and you can reach them at that number. Sometimes when we're in distress, it's not always at a convenient nine to five time. So it's always good to know this is a place you can call to talk to a live counselor and get some support around what the concerns or things you might have. Well, we certainly wish you all good luck and definitely reach out if you're in need of any support. Thank you.